Hey everybody, I'm back again with uh, top 10 highlights for Mounts chapter 23. First of all, a word of introduction. Here's another chapter that looks really technical, really imposing, really complicated when you first look at it. But in reality, there is not much new information here. Let me try and show you why I say that. Let's look at each section. The first section of this chapter talks about the definite article. And it begins with six sections, 23, 1 through 6. And it is true that the definite article has one of the widest ranges of meaning of all Greek words, as 23.1 says. And that the definite article doesn't automatically make something definite, as 23.2 says. But 23.3, 4, 5, and 6 are all reviewing information you've read before in Mounts. So, not much new here, right? How about 23.7 through 23.9? These sections do show you some new ways the definite article can be used. And you may remember these, but you may not. If you don't, then realize that sometimes in English, you will uh, see a, a definite article um, not being used where Greek has one. And it will look strange to you. And you will want to understand why. Why English doesn't translate it. When that happens to you, come back to these sections in 23.7 through 23.9. The next section in chapter 23 talks about diacriticals, punctuation, lexical forms, and post-positives. That is a mouthful to say. And 23, 10 through 15 is where these are covered, but the material in all of these sections is interesting to read over, but there's no need to try and retain any of this. You can reference back to it if or when you ever want to, and I'm guessing that won't be very often. The next section of chapter 23 talks about subject and predicate. The material here is all review in 23.16, 23.17, and 23.18. The next section talks about types of sentences. That's 23.19 through 23.23. Again, this is information to read over, and occasionally a commentator may use some of the terminology here in talking about sentences. But there really is no need to retain any of this except perhaps 23.23, which explains to you that Greek is a hypotactic language. What that means in terms of analyzing the parts of a sentence and phrasing a sentence is that Greek sometimes uses sentences that are much longer than English sentences. Um, and you need to know uh, how all of those relate to each other and that many parts of a Greek sentence are modifying the main part. That's helpful to know when you're doing phrasing. The next section of chapter 23 talks about word order. Word order is probably something you've wondered about. And once you've read over these two sections, you will have the basic information that's useful to explain why a sentence looks like it does in Greek. It is worth knowing, however, that moving something to the front of a sentence what's referred to as fronting this or that element, whatever it is, or when someone says that element is fronted, doing that gives emphasis to uh, that element in the sentence. Uh, it's almost as though that uh, element is being underlined or bold-faced in the sentence. Some don't call this fronting, but instead they talk about left dislocation. It means the same thing. Left dislocation means moving something left as far as you can to the front of the sentence. By the way, Deeper Greek has a really helpful chart uh, with respect to word order in chapter 13. It's on page 456 in the second edition, and it's on page 450 in the first edition. It's worth looking at. The next section of chapter 23 is about idioms. That's 23.26. No need to worry about these two idioms. You'll see their meaning in the English translation of an interlinear when you're using it. And the final three sections of chapter 23, which are sections 27 through 30, simply tell you that phrases that have a noun in them, but are not prepositional phrases or phrases that have a participle, um, that's what a noun phrase is. It's, it's a phrase that has a noun in it, but it's not a prepositional phrase and it's not a participial phrase. Um, 
Phrases like that, what Mounts calls noun phrases, won't confuse you because they function like you would expect them to. If the noun is in the dative, then the whole phrase is acting like a dative noun would, all by itself. If the noun is in the genitive, then the phrase is acting like a genitive noun would when it stands alone. If the phrase is substantive in apposition to another noun, and remember that word apposition just means that two words, two nouns, stand together next to each other, and they mutually modify each other. They're in apposition, mutual modifying, mutually modifying each other. Uh, when that happens, uh, it's the same with a noun phrase as it would be with a, a single noun. The noun phrase plus a noun is the same as two nouns that stand together and modify each other. And that's it for Mounts chapter 23.